Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, episode 49 with Phil Shedd. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. How's it going, guys? Welcome back to another show. Uh, well into lockdown here now. Uh, so, um, obviously a lot of time on my hands, but the one bright side is obviously lots of time to uh, chase up people for podcasts, and then generally people got a bit more time in their hands. So, the uh, football is a very busy industry. So, um, the one silver lining, like I said, is that you get these people, they got, they're got they at home, they've got a bit of off time. So, uh, this, this show, very fortunate to have Phil shared on the show. Phil's the head of coaching at Middlesbrough. First met Phil about six or so years ago, four or five or four or five, six years ago, we were both on the Advanced Youth Award. Then he was head of foundation or head of nice attends at Middlesbrough. Now it's progressed to uh, head of coach. And, and I tell you what, this is like one of the, one of the most um, reflective practitioners I've ever spoken to. He's really honest. He's really open. He talks about his you know, mistakes he's made in the past, how he's learned. Uh, I think obviously that's a real, you know, good sign of a, a top quality practitioner in any field. Is someone who's willing to reflect to maybe say, you know, I didn't do that so well in the past, and I did this well. And obviously, I think in the, in, the, in in the nature of the head of coaching role as well, it's really important to be able to reflect on yourself and be able to listen to other people. And this is real, really engaging hour. Actually, I really enjoyed this chat with Phil and just seeing how much he's progressed as as that the one of that first full time position he had as a nine to ten, and uh, really impressive. Uh, really eloquent uh, lots of knowledge to share so uh, really excited about having you on the show and uh, I know you're going to enjoy it uh, got some big ones coming up as well obviously the next one's the big 5-0 so I've got a bit of a special one coming on so I know you're going to enjoy but they're going to be coming thick and fast so keep tuned and make sure you keep safe so Phil Shedd welcome to the show hey Sol you okay so can you uh, just give us a brief description of your playing and coaching background up to this point please mate yeah certainly so uh, joined Middlesbrough at uh, 8 year old um, and I was with them for 11 years, so went all the way through the 916s program, um, signed my scholarship, stayed with them for two years for the under 18s, and then got another one year extension on top of that, which allowed me obviously to play in the reserves. Um, but unfortunately, at the end of that, I, I mean, I wasn't good enough to, to break into the first team stuff. So it was a little bit of a crossroads, but interestingly, I'd, obviously, you get to do your level uh, your level two coaching badge now as a scholarship. So I had that behind me and um, started to work in some school stuff with my dad's business. I always wanted to get back into the football. Worked at Darlington for, for one year, and they were great. They actually put me through my UEFA B licence. And the academy manager there at the time, Craig Little, is now the academy manager at Middlesbrough, so I've linked back up with him as well. Um, and then, unfortunately, after a year with Darlington, they went bust. But great for me, I had my B licence, so then got back in touch with Middlesbrough, said to them, could I come down and just observe? So I spent six months just observing some sessions. And then when it came to the end of the season, there was some opportunities to come back in and do some part-time stuff. So left in 2011 as a player and then joined back in 2013 as a, as a part-time coach. Did a year with the under-11s, fantastic opportunity, and then followed that group again into the under-12s. So I spent a year with them at under-12s and then we sort of, the, the club, um, made some new roles full-time. So then I applied for the, what was then the lead under-9 and under-10 coach and was successful in getting that role. So that was 2015. And then spent, I think it was about two and a half, three years in that role. Um, and then in 2018, I became the 13th and 14th league coach. That was just for six months. So that was January until the summer. And then our under 16s league coach, he left to go to Dubai. So again, I saw it as a great opportunity. Um, stepped into that role and did that role for, for 18 months, which was really nice because actually the boys that had it under 11s and under 12s, they were 16s at the time. So I stepped into there. Spent 18 months in that role and then the current role that I'm in, the head of coaching role, came up. Andy Foster left to go to Leeds, so I applied and, and was fortunate enough to get that role. So I've been in this role now for, for four months, so a lot of the stuff I've done has been Middlesbrough-based. Wow, that's pretty amazing. You've literally pretty much well spent a lot of your life and at the uh, at the club and also you've seen it as a player all the way from nine, all the way into the coach from nines, all the way to the, to the 18s, 23s as well. Yeah, crazy. I spent. I think. I think I worked out something like twenty of my twenty-eight years of life have been spent with Middlesbrough. So I don't really know much else. 
Wow, amazing. So let's just reverse, go back there then. Um, yeah. Tell us what was it like, what was it like going, going through as a player at Middlesbrough? I mean, Middlesbrough's got, you know, great uh, tradition. You know, famously you played, you know, at a whole age team full of academy graduates at Arsenal that day, well, in the Premier League, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. What, what, was uh, you know, what was it like coming through as a player there? Tell us a bit about your experiences as a player at the Middlesbrough. Oh, it, was, it was an unbelievable experience, I think. First and foremost, I think the club's always been renowned for, for development technically, um, players with real good technical quality. Uh, so that first and foremost, we spend loads of work, technical work. Um, but then just the the environment that the club creates, I think that's, that's something that whenever we get people visiting us and something that I experienced as a kid, the environment's just fantastic. Obviously, the North East is is slightly different to obviously other areas of the country. And sometimes if you're not from the North East, you might not quite get it. But I just think the environment that we create for, for players, a young player like myself coming through. So tell us about that, that. What is that environment like? Yes, some examples. So, the opportunity, so for me, it's about the opportunity to come and try things, but there's never kind of any pressure or, or any um, negativity around people having to go at things. We can try to give people the freedom to fail. And, and I really felt that as, as a young player. I didn't feel pressure every time I went to train and I absolutely loved it. The environment meant that I came running into the doors. And, and then when I left, I was saying to my dad, when can we go back? Um, so for me, the environment's brilliant. It's a real family club. I think if you look through the, the club now, and it was the same when I was there as a coach, the amount of people that are there as, as players and maybe don't make it to the first team level, but actually they're returning as full-time and part-time members of staff. I think that just says a lot about the environment that we create because people continually want to be involved with the football club. And like I say, we've, we've always been renowned for development technical technical footballers. And then over the last few years, I think we've got better with, with different people coming into the building as well and now starting to think about how we introduce all the technical stuff that we're doing but actually then developing the players tactically as well we've really started to, to develop the players physically we're really trying to put the four corners together now but coming through was was brilliant and um, like I say for me it was a it was an opportunity to, to experience lots of different uh, tournaments games and things like that but make some great friends I think I saw I saw lots of people come and go over the time that I was there um, but yeah real, real family club and then tell us a little bit about then towards the end of your playing career there. You said you mentioned you playing the reserves and then the reality was that you weren't good enough for that level. Yeah. Um, what was that like for you personally? You spent your whole, you know, half your life in, an, in the academy system and you realised maybe it was coming to an end. Yeah, tough. I think the one thing I always did, Saul, was I was always somebody, and I still am now, I'm always somebody who looks ahead and has plans, just what if. Um, and I knew coming in as a scholar that that might not be football full time might not be the thing that I end up doing so our coaching was always something on, on kind of the side for me so I was always trying to do a little bit even whilst I was playing um, but it still didn't prepare me for what it was going to feel like um, and one thing I didn't do is I didn't spend a lot of time going to trial other places I think psychologically my head wasn't right at the time the one thing I'd say now as a coach that last year um, that I got because I think for me it was touch and go as to whether I was going to get that extra year from 18 into 19 but I'm so glad that I did I worked with a, a coach called Steve Agnew at the time um, and it was the, around the time where Barcelona Guardiola's first season um, and Steve Agnew was absolutely infatuated with what Barcelona did but I tell you what that season the way that he had us play and the teaching that he did with us that's had a massive impact on how I coach how I teach now and just the way that I think about football um, he for me was, was exceptional so yeah really like I say really really tough to be to be released um, but looking back now you know some some great experiences that I've been able to use to help me and, and to when I'm speaking with players and parents now I can always can always fight back on that It's quite interesting that you mentioned I mean it's, it's, I suppose it's, it's, it can, it's different for a lot of people isn't it so for me my, my major influences were my coach educators who I yeah. first started coaching and but for people like yourself who've gone right through the academy system you know had them really powerful uh, influences from people like Steve Agnew like that people like that that, that helps mould your your career anyone else really stand out who helped you know in terms of your coach development in that in those early days um, I think I think I've been extremely fortunate you know in, in terms of coach development the courses that I've been on the people I've been exposed to at the club so obviously we had Dave Parnaby as an academy manager from when I was nine and when I first came in full time as a coach so you know everybody knows about Dave and knows about their experience his experience sorry across coach development and as academy manager um, I was exposed to, to now Craig Little who's had a fantastic playing career and um, now is our academy manager he's gone through various different coaching age groups I think all the way from nines up to the current job that he's doing, so the experience that he's got is brilliant. Um, in terms of the wider coach education, obviously we had Andy Foster who worked for the FA for a number of years, came into the club, spent about three years with us as head of coaching, again seeing how he did things slightly different to other people. And his background really was coach education. But the one thing that really stands out for me was my A licence. 
So we had Dick Bate on it and we had Ben Bartlett. And I don't know if, if people know much about either character, but Dick Bate, fantastic, really kind of a um, lot of information, a lot of stopping it and, and really talking through things. Then Ben Bartlett, the opposite side, a lot of games-based approach. Um, he's, he's got kind of his own beliefs about how you best develop people. And the exposure to those two was fantastic. I still keep in touch with Ben now. And for me, he's really um, at the forefront, I think, in in modern day coaching in terms of making it sort of towards the players but actually getting out the outcomes that he wants through individual challenges and linking it to ILPs within a team team session so I mean I've probably missed out loads of people there so people will be annoyed when they don't hear their name but I feel like I've, I've had um, exposure to some really great people So then you mentioned then you started doing some stuff in schools with your was that with your dad you said with his business or something? Yeah so I was fortunate he had a business it's been going for quite a while now so that was that was around kind of PE based stuff Right, uh, and, so, and so tell us about that in terms of how important was those first, you know, we've all, like, most coaches have been down that road, worked within schools or big groups, community schemes, and how important were those first uh, few, those first sessions working in the school environment? Oh, massive. I mean, they were a culture shock to begin with. You go from playing football, banter in the dressing rooms and stuff, you've now got kids in front of you, and I was working with kids from as young as four all the way up to 18, so no two days look the same, so I could be on a morning working with four-year-olds, on an afternoon working with 16-year-olds, um, but what it did is it taught me how to, to communicate with adults, in terms of the other teachers, people a lot of the time are older than me, and also ways to communicate with a variety of different children, because we weren't always working in the most affluent areas, so I think you learn to communicate in different ways, so communication always isn't just the way that we speak to each other, but there's lots of different ways that I can communicate with these children. And I think that was massively important and, and that um, whether this is the right time to mention it, but I think that comes down into, into coaching stuff. You know, a lot of people, when they take on roles, particularly ex-players or people who have been in through academy setups and itself, they don't want to come and start at the bottom. They don't want to come and start part-time or they don't want to come and start with the under-9s and under-10s. That, for me, was, was the best um, grounding that I had. And, and I don't know whether you want me to go into that now or later on, but for me, starting with the youngest in the school stuff and then the football stuff has been the best grounding I've had. So, then, so then tell us a bit about then your first role at, at Darlington, how that come about and what exactly what you're doing. Yeah, so to be honest with you, um, so Craig Little, who was the academy manager at the time, he knew me a little bit because actually he coached me at Middlesbrough, so he'd been a part-time coach there, I think, while he was still playing, to be honest with you. So he knew a little bit about me, he knew my dad as well. Um, so he just gave my dad a call when I'd been released, asked whether I, I fancied doing some coaching. Um, so I took, I think it was their under 11s. I took their under 11s for a year. And I'll be honest, so I just dropped out of, um, just dropped out of football. And to be honest with you, when I look back now, um, I wasn't great. I mean, the standard of my coaching was really, really poor. But actually, not only that, I just think my commitment levels were nowhere near. It's interesting. Me and Craig can laugh about it now and the positions that we're in. But um, very fortunate that I've had the opportunities to to put that right since really. And so, I mean, t- and what were those first, you know, what was that first season like in terms of, you know, your session design? What, where did you pull from your resort, you know, to, to plan sessions and deliver that and into those, to the age group? Really poor. So, like, I used to pull from my head, really. I used to have that impression that, you know what, I, I've, I've, I've played, I've had loads of sessions, I've played, had loads of sessions at this age group. I know what I'd do. I'd drive there, I'd just get the equipment out and I'd just chuck something together. And when I look back now... The players won't have learned or developed anything from me that season positively. They'll have, they'll have learned themselves. They'll have developed, of course, through the games programme that we had and the training. But what, what impact I actually had on any individual that season, I don't believe would have been positive, if I'm honest. Uh, OK, so uh, and obviously was, well, we're not, we're not going to blame you for the club going bust, are we? <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, let's, let's talk about the, you, you, the, club, the club, unfortunately... Um, that role doesn't exist anymore so then you, you start going to Middlesbrough to observe so tell us a bit about that what what yeah so, what, what, so what, what kind of try to, on. yeah well I try I try to kind of call on my the contacts that I already had really I mean that was always the ambition I remember I actually went down to Darlin, uh, to Middlesbrough with Darling when I was there and I remember speaking to some people um, who obviously were at the club when I was there and they just said once you get your B licence let us know because we want you to come back so I just thought, right, now's the time to drop a call in. And they were great, really accommodating. And, and they gave me full access, which the club always do. And they still do that now. They're fantastic with, with coaches and developing people. Um, but I came in and I just I, I looked across the variety of age groups. And like a lot of people, for me, I wanted to watch the 13s, the 14s, the 15s and the 16s. I mean, I was nowhere near that level. I remember they let me put a session on for the under-15s one evening. I actually knew the coach still because he'd been a part-time coach when I was coming through as a kid. And that was a that was a real shock for me. I was well below the level that was required to kind of work with those players at that at that age. So, uh, what, what, so in what ways? What, what tell us that you know? In what ways did you think were you below level? What what was missing from your session then? 
my, te- my technical knowledge wasn't there for the, for the level that the players were at. My tactical knowledge wasn't there. My, my session planning in terms of actually what they needed at that stage in their development certainly wasn't there. Um, and if you look at the players who were part of that group at the time, you, you had like Harry Chapman, who's now with Blackburn. You had Hayden Corson, who broke into our first team. So you had, you had players who had real, real quality. Um, and I just didn't have the technical tactical knowledge to even start to think about planning a session for that age group. And I probably didn't understand in terms of communication styles, how I'd get the best out of different players uh, on uh, that age group. Interesting. So then tell us a little bit how that developed and when it ha- when it turned into that under-11 role. Yeah, so again, probably being very honest, for me, it was probably my naivety. So actually in that summer, there were some full-time roles came up and some part-time roles. Um, I actually stupidly applied for a full-time role, you know, because I thought, yeah, I know, what, I know what I'm doing. There was a full-time role, I think it was something like 13, 14. Thank God I never got it because I would never be where I am now. Um, but what they did do is they rang me up, the guy who was the lead for the 11s and 12s at the time, and just said to me, listen, um, we've got a part-time role under 11s. Dave's recommended that you'd be good to speak to. Um, do, do you want to come in and have a chat? And I did. I went in and we had a chat about it. It was very, very informal. I think I kind of got in really off the back of, of who I was more than what I could actually do. Um, and then the journey just started there, really. And again, when I look back, I think it's all this happens all the time, every job I've been in. So when I jump through different roles, when I look back, um, I probably wasn't ready for that. I wasn't definitely didn't again. My planning and preparation wasn't good enough. I didn't think about the individuals within a team session, how I'm going to develop them. My technical stuff in terms of ball mastery and things like that wasn't bad. I was okay at doing things like that because we'd spent a lot of time doing it as I came through. But my, just my general game knowledge wasn't great. But I tell you, the one thing that I think Middlesbrough have always done well is um, Craig does it now and Dave did it when he was academy manager giving staff the licence to try things not being afraid again to make mistakes very much like the players and I think that's a very good way for people to develop and obviously now heads of coaching have came in who are and maybe there to try and support coaches a little bit more but I'd like to think we can still keep that environment in Middlesbrough where coaches feel like they have the opportunity to plan prepare, deliver and not be worried about making mistakes if they try something new because that's how we all learn but so, how, how, who did you learn off, and how did tell us about your evolution as a coach? Then, from being you know under 11s, you know you're not maybe prepared, and how do yeah. you become prepared and be that good 11s coach? I think one thing I've always tried to do is I've always tried, and, and it doesn't have to necessarily be somebody working at the same age as me, but I've always tried to, uh, to go and watch coaches that have maybe similar values to me, or maybe have totally opposite. I remember when I started the under 11s, first six months for me was a real challenge because the the guy that I worked with was just polar opposites to me. He was really kid orientated, um, a little bit kind of out there. But I tell you what, I learned a lot from him about how, again, how to interact with children, how to make things fun. He had a real focus on the individual within a team session, and I learned a lot about that. And I think for me, it's just about, about it's, I've always been open minded to what other people do, and I've always got things in my mind that, that are my beliefs that I've developed over time. But I think if you're open minded to the things that other people are doing, and I think it's really easy to say, I'm not having him. I'm not having what he's doing. It might not sit with, with kind of what I believe in, but there'll definitely be something there that I can take. No matter, I, I truly believe no matter how good or bad any coach, people perceive a coach is, you'll always be able to take something from them. And so tell us a bit about then the philosophy at Middlesbrough. When you go in there, you're in the foundation phase, what does it look like um, You know, explicitly? What are the key things you're working on? Tell us what a typical session for the under-11s looks like. Is that when I was there, or is that what we've tried to develop into well, now? Well, when you well when you maybe first went there, I mean, you talked about a long tradition of creating technical players and that sort of thing. How did you do that? Yeah, so we've always kind of opened sessions up with a lot of ball mastery work, so boys getting a, a ball on their own. I think that bit's key. I think you know, and players nines to elevens all the way through, all the way through probably, but particularly the foundation phase, quite selfish. And not in a bad sense, but they want the ball all the time. So I think giving them the ball as much as possible. Um, so lots of ball mastery, unopposed stuff, ball juggling, tricks and turns. That's something that was there when I was there as an under-11 and then as a coach in under-11. And then when we try to do games-based stuff, again, try to keep it smaller practices. So 1v1s, we want players to be and still the same now. We want players to be able to, to dominate 1v1 both in and out of possession. So if we want them to dominate 1v1 in and out of possession, we've got to give them the opportunity to practice that practice 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 we're not too concerned about the team element between nines and elevens if i'm honest we we would look to really develop like that technical basics um well the brilliant basics some call it lots of bits and bits and bobs of passing and receiving we were quite big on that when i first started as an under 11 part-time coach um and then we did move to a little bit of a model where we went whole part whole so we, the boys would arrive we'd start with a game 
at 5.30 and if people were arriving late, they'd just jump into the game. That was pretty much player-led. And then we'd come away from that, we'd do all the ball mastery, all the technical work, and then we'd go back into the game-based stuff. So that was kind of what it looked like when I first started. And so then tell us about your, you get your first full-time roles, nines and tens lead. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? And then what are the first sort of things you tried to do as you knew as head of that, that age group, those age groups? I think probably try to do too much, if I'm honest. Um, probably, cause the, so they never had a nine and tens lead before I stepped in. So there was an under 12, nine to 12 lead coach. Um, and I think I, I, I saw I say too much but actually I just tried to carry on the things that he was doing um, but then maybe put my own little slant on it maybe a bit too soon though because actually sometimes if it's, if it's not broken don't fix it always be looking for, for ways that we can develop the things that we're doing really really well and, and keep making them better but um, maybe try to change things a little bit too soon but for me it was all about the players enjoying themselves having loads of touches of the ball loads of ball mastery loads of 1v1 opportunities and and Again, they come with a smile on the face, they leave with a smile on the face. That, for me, at the younger ages, if you can get them to love the environment, you get them in, they've got a smile on the face, you capture them, you then have a chance to teach them moving forward. If you don't capture them in that first bit and get them to love the environment, we're going to have a challenge as they move through the programme. So tell us about, about games day then, on for the nines and tens, you're playing games on the weekend, uh, you're playing your local rivals. Uh, what does yeah. that look like? Obviously, if you've got a philosophy which is really based on individuality and creativity yeah. and not so much... Uh, formation or team based does that have an effect on the game on Sunday and is some sort do you have to convince the parents that you know this is a long term project yeah 100% I think what two things in that one the parents understanding what the long term vision looks like because it'll be the same everywhere now particularly with pre-academy starting so early it's crazy that parents are actually choosing clubs that their boy goes to based upon their pre-academy results we've never been one even at pre-academy level about actually want to win games, want to develop players even at that stage. Um, so getting them to understand what our journey looks like from 9s, 10s, 11s, 12s, all the way through. And then also coach behaviours, because it's all right us saying this is what we do, but actually then if it comes, like you say, a derby game, then our coach behaviours go out the window, the players don't feel comfortable, the environment's not right like I talked about at the start, then what we say we do, we don't do anymore. And I think we've found, to be honest with you, all the way through, even when I was a player, people will say, technically really good players, but actually physically sometimes underdeveloped because we wait with players who are maybe um, smaller or less developed. The, they're maybe going to grow in time, the late developers, as they would call them. So, yeah, we might we might get overrun, we might get turned over by our local rivals who physically might be better than us, but that doesn't concern us. As coaches, we can see the longer-term picture. Like I said before, our challenge is convincing the parents of the longer-term picture. And we've got loads of experience in the building, so... I'd hope, I'd hope that they, they feel comfortable with that. I said that's a challenge. I mean, I worked uh, when I was at Spurs, a very much similar sort of philosophy where it's based around that. And you did have to take, you know, a lot of uh, tonkings on the weekend with, you know, academies who are set up to win, maybe. So, yeah. I mean, that, I suppose that's the battle, though, isn't it? Because, you know, everyone knows recruitment's the key to a good academy, trying to convince the players that, you know, down the line it's going to be get a lot better. Um, when does that change then in the academy when actually then that winning mentality becomes important or when. Well, listen, first, first and foremost, I think kids want to win no matter what. So when the kids come into us at under eight, I think they want to win. That's my true belief anyway. Kids that are involved in sport, competitive sport, they want to win. I think it's sometimes us as coaches who can take that away or use it as an excuse depending upon results or things like that. So winning matters all the way through. We just don't show it in our behaviours. You know, We as coaches want to win, the players want to win. But I think even all the way up to, up to under 16, you know, obviously winning becomes a little bit more important every time, but we constantly will talk about the way we play, developing individuals, um, the environment, players uh, going by our core values of honesty, humility, respect. These things are more important to us between nines and sixteens. The players should want to win. It's a coach behaviours that shouldn't change depending upon the result. Interesting. And tell us what about then practically as well. Now you're managing, you've got to manage staff. What was that yeah. like, you know, as in terms of a new, learning a new skill set to, to manage and inspire the staff to, to develop those players for you or with you? Yeah, crazy. I mean, obviously, I've known some of the staff for quite a while now for the various different roles that I've been involved in. And this, this job's a bit like the school job that I started in, no two days have been the same. Um, I think the experiences that I've had of going through the different age groups, being able to look back on my own coach behaviours and how I've maybe reacted um, particularly at the start of my, my coaching depending upon the results and things like that that's really helped me to understand um, how I might then work with newer coaches who are coming in I think we're fortunate particularly at the, the 18 to 23s we've got staff with a lot of experience there who've been there for quite a while 
the nice 16 staff. We've got some new staff in there. We've got some staff who've been at other clubs. Um, so we've got a real variety. It's, it's, for me, it's not about taking away the things that they're really good at or their characteristics. It's just about helping them to understand um, maybe the differences or, or if they do things slightly differently. So a better example would be, so part of our curriculum now, our philosophy, we've got something we call creative week in week 12, so the final week. The idea is that's obviously for the players, but it's for the staff as well. So what we're asking staff to do is if you're somebody who's quite, um, you like to be off the, the side of the pitch, setting lots of challenges, you don't really communicate a lot during sessions, you're quite quiet, um, that's absolutely fine. But on creative week, we want you to be somebody who goes and steps in, does lots of demos, sees what it's like and you can then look at the players and go okay this is how I coach this is what I get for 11 weeks but in the 12th week I'm coaching a little bit differently what's the differences that I get from players what's their behaviours depending on how I work with them and then the same for a coach who's maybe quite vocal steps in a lot does a lot of coaching a lot of teaching week 12 can they do a little bit of stepping back uh, planning for maybe blocks of work only talk during the blocks uh, the intervals of the blocks of work or, or maybe games based more games based approach with challenges and things like that so yeah that's how we try to kind of um, educate and what's, and what's, what's, that's really interesting actually and how the how the staff responded to that well interestingly we were just in the first cycle of that so we've just started it and, and obviously with this now um, kicking in there's no coaching going on so we actually haven't reached week 12 yet um, haven't chatted to, to staff I think the, the, the words were interesting and I think it'll be something that's ongoing I don't think you're ever going to get anybody to massively change and I think it's going to take two or three rounds of that before people really feel comfortable because they'll have a perception if I'm there, the academy manager's there, or, or parents even, you know, they'll they'll know what they're normally like and they'll probably feel like they have to keep being that way. So I think it's going to take a couple of rounds to really get to maybe where we want to get with it. And again, I don't think it's going to going to be groundbreaking. I don't think it's going to change coaches uh, the way that they, they do things all the time. But it might just give them an understanding how different players respond differently to, to the way that they're spoken to. And yeah, actually, it's... It's really sorry to interrupt, mate. It's just it's really interesting that you you're really asking coaches to come out of their comfort zone, there, aren't you? You know, be you know take on a new identity, do something different. Yeah, massively because I think and that comes a little bit from my journey. So I know that when I started, I try I was probably somebody who stopped it and was in quite a little, quite a bit and trying to impart my knowledge on the players. I think the beauty of what I've learned over time is actually. It's great to have knowledge, and you have. To, I think you have to have knowledge to be able to help the players. But it's about understanding when the players need that knowledge, and actually, you might have something in your mind that you want to give them, but it's not the right time. You have to be able to see what the player needs at that moment and give them that in whatever way that is by actually telling them or by setting them a challenge or by giving them the opportunity to trial and error. Interesting. And so, and tell us a little bit about you, know, you, you talk about sometimes you're associated with smaller technical players. What, tell us about the recruitment process. What are you looking for? Firstly, how, what is your recruitment area in terms of how many players have you got to choose from? What's your population area of, you know, roughly, of the sort of your intake, your potential intake? I mean, to be honest, an interesting question about the, the um, population. I wouldn't know, but it, it's, it's not huge. So you've got to think, I mean, for us to recruit from Leeds, that's, that's right on the kind of the border of time-wise that people can recruit. For us to recruit from Newcastle, that's right on the border of the, the time that you're allowed to recruit from within. So really, we've got the Teesside area, um, a little bit into kind of Durham, Sunderland, but you've got, I think, Newcastle, Sunderland, us, Leeds. I mean, it used to be Hartlepool and Downton as well are all fighting for these these players. Um, mm. But I'll tell you what, one thing that's been great, you know, you asked about the club at the start and the chairman's always said he wants to give children of Teesside and surrounding areas the opportunity to, to become professional footballers and we're really, really big on that. Of course, now we do, as they get older, kind of 17s, 18s, 19s, we recruit a few from abroad. But again, minimal. You know, a couple of years back, we played in the UEFA Champions League, Youth League, as it was, under-19s. And I think it was something like we only had two players who weren't homegrown, like from Teesside and surrounding areas, which is a massive achievement to be in that competition with, with that. Yeah, it's fantastic. And then, so tell us a little bit about then your next roles, 13s to 14s. Um, what was, yeah, that what, was, what a, was that like? Yeah, it was quite a short role, that one, to be honest with you. So we had a, we had a member of staff who'd been off for quite a while. So part-time staff had looked after it for kind of the first half of the season. Um, so then I picked up in January. Um, and I think the, the difficulty with that, and I, and I learned a lot about it, really. So the one thing that I've always done when I've, I go into any jobs, I want to hit the ground running. But I think with that one, that's one where I should have done more of what I do now, which is, is step back observe because these staff the part-time staff have done a great job for the first four or five months of the season I probably went in and maybe tried to, to change things a little bit too quickly just in terms of the delivery of sessions how things were being done and I think that was necessary that was needed a little bit because I think part-time staff had their own way of doing things I think it's really important as lead coaches and now as head of coaching that we 
we get the Middlesbrough Football Club way across to everyone. Um, but yeah, so I was in that I was in that role for four or five months. I learned more about myself and how to manage people in that five six months than what I probably did about football as such, just because, like I said, the experience with um, with part time staff. And, and and tell us practically what was the difference between you know you've been coaching the foundation phase now you're in the thirties and forties you, you reflected when you first started you did that session yeah I mean were you more prepared now for that time and, you know, yeah I think I was I think I was more prepared like I said to you I, I mean I'd done my I think I'd done my air license about a season before that so I've always been one who, who would go and watch first team examples or eighteens twenty threes and think about it and how I can relate that to it doesn't matter whether it's nines and tens whether it's thirteens uh, and fourteens fifteen sixteens for me. You can you can adapt any session, so you can increase it or decrease it depending on the age of the players. Um, but yeah, tactically, obviously, you challenge a little bit more on the games program from that point of view. Obviously, you start to get the cup competitions as well. So we talked about the coach behaviours before; they really start to get tested as well. Um, and then also, I think you're working with part-time members of staff who have probably got a little bit more knowledge, or certainly feel like they've got a little bit more knowledge. So it's, it's dealing with different characteristics of staff as well. But from a football point of view, I think tactically was where I was was probably challenged more greatly and that was the bit that really got me I loved that bit and that was the bit that made me think the 16s I would absolutely love it because the games program kicks on again following the 18 stuff and the tactical element of things that we need to do would, would really be stretched and, and really challenge me and tell us about a 30, typical 13 to 14 sessions there then you talked about the whole part whole thing at, at the foundation a lot of skill uh, freedom ball mastery then tell us what a 13 to 14 session would look like typically yeah, so I think we would certainly wouldn't um, lose that element of technique work. So there still needs to be that built in. Um, so there'd, there'd still be your passing stuff. There'd still be a ball master. There's still value for me in doing your your tricks and turns or your, or your ball juggling or just your, your general technical ball mastery stuff. Probably over a shorter time than what we'd spend with the foundation phase players. We'd do lots of passing and setting, receiving work. But then obviously when we go into the games based stuff, we might start to introduce kind of um, phases of play or, or mini games based practices, trying to give the players the opportunity to experience what they're going to experience on a weekend that's always been the big thing for me so there'll be loads of times where people decide that they're now going to play with a back three for example because it's, it's in fashion and um, this is just an example by the way but then what they'll do is they'll not have done anything through the week the players will never have experienced playing as a back three but then we'll chuck them in on a Sunday they won't perform very well and it'll be their fault not ours as coaches so I think for me it's as we get into the 13s and 14s to start to put sessions together that challenge them tactically but again give them the chance to experience what they're going to experience in the game um, and what about like interpersonal communication and motivation and working with uh, young teenagers compared to working with foundation phase yeah well it was in, it was interesting we, we laughed about it actually last year so the when I picked them up the, the 14s I'd have managed to um, I'd managed to miss them out for a couple of years and they were renowned for being uh, a few characters in the group shall we say um, we certainly clashed over those first few months but I tell you what obviously I then moved into the 15s, 16s and picked that group up again and that three or four months taught me a lot again probably I'd gone in with a perception of how you need to deal with teenagers and I almost tried to get them to do what it was we wanted in terms of their values and their beliefs um, and, and some of them weren't ready for that because that's not and shouting and using uh, and being quite vocal with people like that sometimes doesn't work so sometimes you've got to hold players like that to account for things. So I learned a hell of a lot in those those few months about how to, to manage and deal with and create relationships with players of an older age. Um, that, that for me was, was really key. And I say we laugh about it because at the end of last season, our 15-16s had a real, real good season, making the quarterfinals of the, the Premier League Cup, the quarterfinals of the semifinals, I can't remember, of the Floodlit Cup. And um, we, we kind of laughed about the first one, one time when we went away and they'd left all the bibs and stuff on the, the bus and we brought them in and then I, I, ran, I took them out after the game and ran them. And when I look back now, that's, that's definitely not the right thing to do. And a lot of people say, no, it is the right thing to do because that's what you would maybe do at the, at the older age groups. But then moving into the 15, 16, one thing I try to do is hold them account to their actions. So um, whether this is relevant or not, we set up like a, like a point system. So if, if a piece of equipment was left out, if... Um, a ball balls came out that weren't pumped up if people got there late not because of parents but they were sat in the dressing room and just wandered out of training that would be a point every time they got five points the lads agreed that they would cut, they would have a, a really hefty forfeit so there's that element of they're still kids they're going to make mistakes they're not going to get everything right they're sometimes not going to pump the balls up but actually as you get a two, three, four points the, the lads start to dig each other out and make sure that the standards were right 
it stopped me then having to get into a, a battle with them. And when they did hit five, I just say, right, lads, you've hit five, let's go. And and um, yeah, that was something that I learned. I suppose it's interesting, isn't it? Because like we've all been there. I mean, you know, it's a lot easier to manage, motivate, and can train if you like those nines, tens, elevens when the teenagers and then the hormones kick in, and you, you know you don't get into those individual sort of battles that maybe you know they're very difficult to win. I think with the players that age, though, I think um, one thing that I really use in the 15, 16 stuff, and I know I'm jumping onto that bit now. They know they know a lot. Some of these boys have been in the academy programs for a long time, so a lot of our 15, 16s have been in that program from under nines and under tens. But not not very often do I see people really delving into what they know. I think getting them involved, getting buy-in from them, I think can be can be really really important. There's times where I've got them to almost think that they've chose the starting lineup for the for the weekend, or they've chose the for not the starting lineup, the formation that we're playing. But really through clever questioning and and little bits of that I've dripped in here and there, they basically chose to play the way that we wanted to as a as a club. But they think that they've done it, so the buy-in's bigger, and and then they think that they're managing their own behaviours and they're having an input. And to be honest with you, I think that applies to to half time and ends of games. Not not very often do I hear coaches and I know people say, well, this, this is not right. You're there to help them 100. But actually, how often do you ask the players first? Do we find out what they're seeing, what they're thinking? Because if we understand what they're seeing, if we understand what they're thinking, then we might be able to help them with the challenge that they're facing in front of them. And then if they're maybe not um, seeing the things that you're seeing or having the challenges, they haven't recognised the challenges that you think they're facing. You've then got a choice. Do you go with the things that they're experiencing or then as a coach, well, actually, no, I, I understand what they're saying, but this is really the issue and I've, and I've got evidence to back it up because all the coaching departments see that. Interesting. And it's, tell us about then the 16s role, uh, how that came about and then your experiences in there. Yeah, so our lead coach obviously went went across to Dubai, so he, he's living and working out there now. Tough um, Oh, yeah, tough. Yeah, I bet he's struggling in the weather. Yeah. But um, yeah, so then I obviously applied for the, the role um, and, and took that role on. Like I say, it was nice because that's the first time I'd seen the guys that I'd had at 11s and 12s. So I, I picked them back up at under 16s and um, that was fantastic. Like I say, tactically, that, that was the most I'd been stretched. The games program's brilliant, so it follows the under 18s games program. And because where we are in the, in the North East, our games program, even though it's a Category 1 club, can be limited at times in terms of how many other Category 1 clubs we play. We're under 16s, we're playing real good opposition every single week. So our players are tested more. Technically and tactically, we find out a lot more about our players. But actually, you start getting introduced to better competitions, cup competitions, and that really tests you as a coach tactically. But like I say, we, we don't go abroad too often. We go abroad as much as we can, but don't go abroad too often. And we're, we're not always able to get into the kind of the knockout stages of cup competitions. So our exposure to actual, um, again, like you said, the start having to win things is limited. So 15s, 16s and then 15s as well. Having to be put in those situations, managing your own coach behaviours, tactically being able to adapt and develop things based on what's going on, but actually sticking to the principles of, of us as a football club, what we say we want to be in Middlesbrough Football Club where. I think that was a that was a great challenge, something I really, really enjoyed. And then how you structure your week's programme, so obviously you get more contact with them. So how you build up your week to work towards a weekly theme, but also um, make sure that individuals are catered for within that weekly theme, again, to continue on the development process that the players are experiencing all the way through. Okay, so a couple of things I want to just pick out there. So yeah. talk about then, can you give us an example, like you talked about when you, you were tactically stretched or... You know, in yeah. a game, can you, can you talk? Give an example in a game where you've thought, seen something, and then maybe, I mean, obviously, look, you're a very reflective guy, and you've been really open and honest. It's been great. So, can you think about a time that maybe sort of, you know, you've looked back and you saw something, or you changed something in the game, or maybe reflected on the game, said, oh, "I should have done that," because it's much more, you know, of a tactically challenging environment. I think uh, the one I always look back on, which really, I, I kind of beat myself up a little bit about, is. Uh, last season, the 15s away to Wigan in the I can't remember whether it was the quarter or semi final of the um, of the Fudlick Cup. So we're travelling down. I know we're already stretched for bodies. So we basically we've we've lost loads of players through the week through injury and various different things. So we're, we're basically down to the bare the bare eleven. Um, and I've I've put way too much thought into it before we've got to the game. So I've ended up adapting and changing the way that we would normally play in terms of formation. And I've tried to fit one of our key players um, into an area that allows him to cheat effectively but hopefully it helps us anyway we got pressed really really high that night um, but I was big on playing out it was one thing that I always believed in playing out and and trying to dominate possession keep the ball moving if you've got possession you're less likely to, to concede in my opinion um, 
And we, like I say, we got really pressed that night. Now, the way we had to play, we had a right-footed centre-back playing a left centre-back. Um, and we had a few of the square pegs and round holes, people right-footed playing left side of the pitch. But we kept trying to play and we kept getting caught out. And on that night, and it happened recently, actually, when I was speaking to a coach, the thing that I really toyed with afterwards, should I have... And we, by the way, when I'm talking about this, we drew 2-2 and got beat on penalties at the end. We were winning 2-1 in the 90th minute and give a penalty away which I think was a dubious penalty if it had been at Millsbury, I'm not sure it had been given. But regardless, the thing that I, I really stew on is, is it right to stick to your football and beliefs or the, the club's football and beliefs and keep playing no matter what, even when we were under immense pressure? Or would it have been right to understand that, do you know what, sometimes we have to adapt and we have to we have to change what we do? Had we changed, had we changed that night and maybe gone a little bit more direct, if you want to call it, and played a little bit more for territory, would we have won the game? Possibly. I, I don't know, but that's one that always sits with me. It was one where I remember talking to our head of coaching afterwards, like really kind of beating myself up about it, about should I have changed what we did. But I think when I look back now, no, it, it, you know, the players want to win, I want to win, but it's still a part of their development. And them carrying on that Middlesbrough Football Club way, playing out under pressure, they'll learn more from that, haven't they? And yeah, we got beat on the night, but actually they'll learn more from that experience. And if I said, right, do you know what, forget everything we normally do, let's just go direct because this game requires that. You sometimes got to see the long term picture despite the competition of the game. So you, so you, so you are saying then you, you were, you should have stuck. You're good. You're right to stick to your principles. You did. Have you, I, have you settled that now? That have you that internal yeah. demon? I think I was right to stick stick to my principles, but I think certain players needed more help on the night than maybe they got. And I think that may be where you, you think about it at half time. Who needs what? Is it the whole team that needs something, or actually are certain individuals that need a little bit more? You know, people always think half times for the team don't get me wrong I'm sure there's team the roles are team elements that can be helped but actually the individual within the team is probably having a bigger impact positively and negatively than the whole team itself and tell us a little bit about then you talked about that your weekly programme tell us what a weekly programme looks like for uh, under 16 at Middlesbrough yeah so to be fair Monday night would be um, kind of like a lighter night for us so we'd have half an hour of gym based activity so we split the 15 and 16s off, so they'll go in the gym for half an hour each. So for example, 5.30 till 6 and then 6 till 6.30. Whilst, say, the 16s in the gym from 5.30 till 6, the 15s would do what we class as their ILPs, their individual-based practice. Um, so they'll work with coaches and small mentor groups working around their, their basic, basic technique work of what we've identified as their ILP. And that is real low-key, uh, low intensity but we, we demand high quality I think that's a real important thing for when you're doing technical practices obviously some of the ball mastery stuff that's high intensity but when you're talking about maybe someone developing their longer pass or something like that it doesn't have to be high, high intensity for us we don't believe in that but we think it has to be high quality um, so that that would be what the first half an hour would look like two half an hour slots of that and then from 6.30 till kind of 7.30 it'll be small sided games in quite a tight confined area so we'll call that a small night um, small areas night so it'll be 6v6s, 5v5s, like I say, high intensity, with the ball flying off the walls, um, lots of contact, lots of 1v1 challenges. Uh, so that's what a Monday looked like. Quite Again, because it's quite light, the football bit's quite intense. But And then what we'll do is we'll move on to Wednesday where we'd have a large areas night. Um, and that would be what we'd call more of our tactical stuff. So the night would still look like um, we'd still do some technical work to begin with. But then we might start looking at maybe more whether you want to call it phase of play or functional press or whatever but 9v9s if we've got enough to have 11v11 and teach within that then teach within it but if not 9v9s or back fours against uh, three centre forwards or, or things like that um, but also when, I've, when I'm talking about small and large areas I'll talk to you about that at the end and then Thursday night would be a, a, again a little bit more low key more maybe thinking a little bit towards the weekend but the one thing I never did with the 15s 16s it was I never changed um, the way that we would play or the style in which we would play for the opposition we might maybe work on something that didn't work last weekend in terms of playing out or maybe midfield rotation or forwards running behind but it would always be around us I think we should always plan for what we do but be mindful of the opposition so you can't at any point just say I'm not even interested in what they do but I think you've got to be mindful of them but I think you should always in a development programme in my opinion we should be looking to develop our players in our way and not worrying too much about what the opposition do and then in turn, that night would just be um, a normal areas night, so you, you could choose. And the reason we've gone small, large, and then and then what we'd call normal is we're trying to bridge the gap between the boys coming in under 18s, 23s and first team. So we had Frankie Hunter come in, um, head of sports science, 
and um, she basically has this like games based model so it's there's area size I'm not going to say too much about but there's area size that goes small go with large areas and then normal areas based around players covering certain yardage so then it would replicate what it looks like on a weekend and um, so you can get all your technical tactical work out but actually they're developing their physical and aerobic capacity um, and aerobic as well so she's, she's added that in so we use that 15 16s all the way up to the first team that, that's been great so that's where the small large area stuff comes from and by the way, we use that, and because there'll be a lot of people saying, "Oh, that's a sports science world of football." Well, actually, sports science does play a big part, I believe, in football now. But it's definitely a football world. They're giving us those area sizes to help and to advise. But if we say, "No, actually, that area size doesn't work for us now," they're not saying you have to train that area size. They're saying if you train in this area size, this will be the outcome that you'll get from a physical point of view. Interesting. So then, so then you say so Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah. And then yeah. day release, sorry, and then we've got a day release, which is a Friday. Right. So obviously day release is always a little bit of a challenge in terms of um, boys coming out of 15s and 16s because of school work. And we'd always say that they should go back to school and, and school is the most important thing. Um, but we, have, we tie it in on a Friday so they can do match prep and things with the under-18s. Um, that, would be, that would be a session on the morning, so they'll train for like two hours on the morning. And that, that, is, that is quite light, so that's a lot of technical work. First half an hour is all technical work, low-key lots of touches of the ball then we'll go into some sort of shape practices quite a lot of times the 16s would be there to support the under 18s and then they'll finish with a little game so just preparing them for the next day okay and then sunday recovery day then yeah sunday recovery sunday day. Day, unless i mean sometimes obviously the 15s have got games on the sunday as well so it's, a, it's an interesting balance in terms of managing them the one thing we do we don't generally carry big numbers at 16s and 15s unless we feel like we've got really really good groups because we prefer to stretch our our 15s players we're not saying that people have to play up all the time i think there's benefits of people being the best player in their own age group as well but once again the 15 16 you know if people are ready then we want to see them stretched and playing the under 16s i think we've got a real good balance of, of playing people up so you've you've had most roles at the club and there's one that you haven't had yet obviously that one comes up the head of coaching Tell us about yeah. that, how, how, how it came up and a little bit about those initial experiences. Yeah, so obviously Andy Foster had been our head of course, I think for about three years and I had a real good relationship with Andy. Um, so he's moved on to Leeds now. So that role came up and um, I applied and that was that was definitely the most rigorous interview process I've been through, without a doubt. <laughs> that was interesting. So I did the interview process, two stages, um, got the role and then... Um, sorry and then um, started obviously Andy did like kind of a week's handover I think for me the, the first few months have been it's a challenge because for me there's two two elements to it a lot of people would say you should come in and just observe so a lot of people I spoke to have come in and just observe for four or five months um, but with me I feel like that's that's one thing for people who are coming from outside the club and um, but with, with obviously with myself, I've been in the club for such a long time, I wanted to kind of try and hit the ground run a little bit more. One thing I've always done is whatever role I, I want to try and get next, I always pre-plan. So in my mind, I'll already be writing things down for a role that I potentially want in the future and how I would maybe go about doing that. So I've looked at all the stuff Andy's done, been really fortunate he's left some great stuff behind in terms of um, the, the playing philosophy, the coaching philosophy. But then I've just looked to adapt and tweak it. What I've done is I've, I've got everyone involved in that. So I think communication is absolutely key in this role. And I don't mean just with your full-time staff. So your part-time staff, I think, are just as important. Other clubs work differently to us, but we've got a lead coach for every two age groups, so 9s, 10s, 11s, 12s, so on. And then we have part-time staff underneath them. So the part-time staff are doing a lot of delivery. So it's been about getting them in, um, reassessing the things that we do, so looking at the playing and coaching philosophy, which bits do we agree with, which bits do we maybe not agree with. The big thing that we talked about, which which I'll talk more about after this, is we'd lost some of that element of technical work, ball mastery, the passing drills. Um, this is not a negative. Andy was a big believer in games-based practice, so everything we did, he, he believed about games-based practice. So we maybe lost some of the technical elements of the things that we did. By the way, I saw lots of, lots of positives in both, so that's been a great experience for me. Um, so it's been about yeah working together to develop the playing and coaching philosophy, just changing and adapting little things, um, and just trying to like I say move little bits forward. We we've, we had, we did have our philosophy, so we had almost like six weeks in possession, six weeks out of possession. So we had like in possession, lose possession, out of possession, regain possession, three weeks on each. The one thing we talked about was probably too long out of possession, so we've just manipulated so we're spending more time in possession with the ball. Because like what I spoke about before, we want to concentrate more on what we do than what the opposition do. So six weeks out of possession was just too long. 
Interesting. And so let's just talk about that because you've, you've mentioned you've mentioned game based, you know, quite a few times. You talked about Ben Barlett. I know Ben is one of the best coach educators around. But you've also talked about technical work quite a lot. And you seem to yeah. have like you seem to have got a good balance between. This is what I've argued a lot, and people sort of you know people say you're either in this camp or in that camp. Or actually, you know, people at the top of the game use both elements, and it's just the artist to know when and where to do it. So how important do you think it is to have both of those elements, the game-based stuff and the te- individual technical work, we talk about ball mastery and ball striking, and, and how do you strike that balance of getting the right amount of times and when and where to do it? So I think it's absolutely massively important. I think a lot some people would argue that if you don't play the games-based stuff first, then how do you know which technical elements the players need to develop? Then there'd be an argument that if you don't if you don't have a certain level of technical ability at an academy category one academy the basics then you're going to struggle to have an impact or be able to do certain things within the game. For me, it's about you know ten, technique work doesn't have to last 30, 40 minutes. If you're doing 10, 15 minutes every session or two or three times a week, then then with, mixed in with um, small sided games, mixed in with uh, phases of play, different things like that then I think you strike a real good balance. One thing we've tried to do now just to try to not standardise, but try to develop and build on the blocks of work because, like I say, we, we do rely on a lot of part-time members of staff as well as our full-time members of staff. We've put kind of like almost like a coaching matrix in place, and that's not to restrict what the coaches do, but we've almost tried to say like this amount of technical work and games-based play here as you move into the youth development phase, this amount of games-based practice and this amount of phases of play. We've called it the, the Middlesbrough Football Club uh, games based problems so we've put like a best practice session library together for that um, but the coaches still have the opportunity to deliver how they feel that that should be delivered it's just trying to give people a little bit of an understanding of you know, when somebody comes into Millsborough understanding what the Millsborough Football Club way looks like um, but I, I think both are really really important for me if you don't have the brilliant basics then you're going to find things diff- more difficult in the games based practices yeah interesting and um, tell us about obviously you know, we first met when you were the nice to tens lead there on that yeah. Advanced Youth Award many years ago. Just tell us about your personal evolution. I mean, obviously, you've been quite open and reflective here. I mean, how important is re- your being a reflective practitioner to you? I mean, you've obviously it is important. So obviously, you you've, you've, you keep reflecting on things and saying how you've improved. Uh, how how you know? Tell us about your evolution from that young coach to where you are now. I think reflecting is is the most important thing. Like I'm relentless with it. I'm probably too reflective. So I'm probably somebody who, who thinks about things all the time when I'm driving home when I'm driving to work when I go to bed I'll wake up in the night I'll still be thinking about things I'll be jotting things down on my phone that I, that I need to think about tomorrow or maybe do tomorrow um, but I think reflecting is really really important if you don't reflect on the things the lessons that you're learning both positively and negatively then I think you're missing a real trick um, and I think there's not I think you know we're in, a, we're in a stage now where not a lot of people are getting on the grass to do coaching but I think it's maybe as a positive, as long as it doesn't last for too long, obviously, that people, how often in football do people get the chance to, to have a couple of weeks to where they can maybe reflect on everything they've done over maybe a short journey or a long journey. Some of our coaches have been with us 10, 10 or so years. You know, how often do you, do you get the chance to sit back and go, these are all the things that I do really, really well. This is where the game's moved to since I first started. These are the bits that I'm not quite sure about. These, I think, are my strengths. These are the, the bits that are maybe my blind spots and things that I'm maybe not comfortable with or not so good at. And being really, really self-reflective. I think, for me, if, if you, if you, I think there's a real beauty to being honest and just kind of putting yourself out there and saying, Do you know what, I don't know this or I'm not very good at this. Can somebody help? But I think football is a, an environment where very few people are willing to do that. To be honest with you. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. And tell us a little bit about then, you know, practically the head of coaching role, very different role to any other within the club. First, yeah. you're probably managing day to day, but also less time on the grass with the players, mm-hmm. much more time watching and feeding back tell us about the, the practicalities of that and you know how do you deal with that do you miss being on the grass yeah listen of course I miss being on the grass like I think that's the buzz that every coach gets I think one thing I said to myself was in the first uh, few months of this job I had two choices so I had a choice where I could be out on the grass quite regularly and just chip away a little bit by a little bit at the things we, we've agreed we're going to develop and change so bits of the philosophy and things like that or I could use the first three four months five months to get out of the grass a little bit, get out every night session, but actually during, during the day, I might have to sacrifice some sessions, get the work done, and then in four or five months' time, there'll only ever be little bits that need evaluating and adapting so I can get out on the grass more regularly. People tell me that you won't be out on the grass in this role. I think it's about prioritising time. You can be out on the grass. But I think also as well, I've chose to go down a route where 
I basically have chose to become a coach developer effectively. So I don't think it's right for me to always take over people's sessions and, and to say, right, I want to take your age group today because inevitably those guys have chose to coach. And I think there's definitely benefits. You have to keep coaching. You have to keep working across a variety of age groups. So I say to the lads, I'm there for you if you're, if you're short or you want to do some individual work or if you want me to deliver anything, then I'll come and deliver it. So I think you have to be able to still keep your to keep dipping your toe in so that you know what's going on you can try things out practically but I think you also have to be there to to support and develop and I think the big thing I've learned in this role is you can go out and watch a session and because all coaches are different you'll have a preconceived idea of what's going on but I think it's really really important to before you maybe give your opinion to the coach about what you're seeing understand what it is that they're delivering so actually ask them what's like what's your thoughts what's going on what you're looking to try and work on what you're trying to develop what's the challenges you've faced Quite a lot of time, we'll have experienced that someone's stepping across your session, not agreeing with what you're doing, but they don't actually understand what you're trying to bring out the session. So I think hopefully I'm trying to create an environment where where we kind of work together like that. So similar principles when you talked earlier about asking the players first what their thoughts were before trying to impose things on them. Is that similar sort of process? Yeah, 100%. So like um, an example I'd give you is one of my first ever observations effectively if you want to call them that because we have from an each little people point of view we have to do a certain amount there's lots of informal observations but formal observations as well and I just said at the end the way I started was listen do you want to have a chat about what I've jotted down he said yeah definitely and I said the one thing I'll say is you know the players better than me because you're working with them more regularly so everything I'm going to talk about here you might say no I, I don't agree with that because this individual works better like this but I said it might just also give you something to consider and it was a great conversation because there was a couple of times where he said totally understand what you're saying however I know say Joe for example Joe deals has a real good understanding of X, Y and Z then he went yeah but I know that Tom over there I totally get what what you're saying and I need to maybe show him and and do this with him and better so that was a real good um, first experience for me and something that I've tried to use now but but again one thing I'm finding out in this job as well is everyone's different and some people some people are really interested in developing some people are really interested in just doing what they've always done you can't help everyone the same some people don't don't want to learn. Some people do. Oh, so that was my next question going to be. Maybe this is associated. What, what's been the major challenges of being the head of coaching? Um, obviously, you're seeing slightly different now. So I was somebody who was in in there as a coach. I, I still have. I still sit in the same office, but I've just moved desk. So one thing I'm really mindful of is the lads will be thinking, well, he's been a coach and he knows what's being said about a head of coaching prior both positively and negatively yeah I'm sat in the rooms they'll be a little bit on edge um but I just think managing different different characters you know there's people in that office who are older than me age-wise with different backgrounds different experiences people have played etc um so I think managing different different um uh, personalities is, is really really interesting different age groups bring about different personalities um but I think for me, it's not about what I want. It's not about what the other coaches want. It's about us all working together on this Middlesbrough Football Club way. But with the players at the heart of it, you know, we are there for the players first and foremost to develop each individual the most that we possibly can. Even the players that are not going to um, get a career for our first team, we've got to do everything we possibly can to develop them as much as we possibly can whilst they're in our building and will not stop until such a point as they're released. And, and um, what sort of qualities would you look for in a coach if you're going to employ a new coach? What sort of things are you looking for to, you know, for well, someone who's going to... Well, it's interesting. We've, we've, if we've, if we've employed quite a few coaches recently because we've had a bit, of, a bit of change around. So obviously I moved so my job came up. Then we appointed from within so another job came up and then we appointed from within for another role. So I think it depends also, to be honest with you. I think it different, depending on the age group of, of um, that the coach is going to come and work in, you look for different qualities. So for me, someone coming in at nines and tens, I'm not too concerned what they know tactically about the game. First and foremost, I want to know, can they connect with the players? I talked about it at the start. If you connect with the players at that age group, the nines and tens, then you're setting up the boys for the 11s and 12s coach and moving forward with a great platform for us to then teach. So at nines and tens, I'm looking for somebody who can, like I say, connect with the players, knows how to technically develop players, tactically doesn't need to know too much, but has a, has a decent understanding of the game. And like in a real good like manner about them, the way that they just their body language, the way that they speak and communicate with the players. I think obviously if you're looking at under 18s, under 23s, then of course you're looking for somebody who has knowledge of the game, both technically, tactically, maybe he's played to a certain level. I'm not I'm not big on this thing about people that have to have played professionally to work at the 18s and 23s. I think uh, this is just again it's my belief. I don't know whether this is appropriate for this, but I think there's, there's maybe three or four different t- styles of coaching. So I think you get. Um, you get a coach who 
maybe he's played or played to an elite level. So you look at Zidane, played to an elite level and they can become an absolute elite coach because they've got hunger and a desire to learn and a thirst for learning. I think you get coaches who have maybe played at maybe a lesser level. And sometimes I find with them coaches that maybe maybe their, a lot of their stuff was around hard work, energy, effort and, and things like that. And maybe sometimes they hold players to that account. So they maybe talk about effort, energy and hard work more. And I think society now children are different to maybe when, when certain people were playing, things like that. And I think you maybe get coaches like like myself who maybe play to, play to a little standard and then, but I've got a real kind of thirst to develop and learn. And they spend time considering what players need, both technically, tactically, but also psychosocially, physically. They do loads of reading, research. They, they try things practically. They involve players in what they do. And I think... Um, you, Trying to trying to strike the balance between getting all those different types of coaches because I think a, within our coaching department we want we want people who've got loads of experience who want really elite coaches want people who are quite naive and want to learn and want to develop so I'm not sure if I've really answered that I think I've waffled but no it's, it's nice. interesting very interesting and, and and so I miss this leads on to the next question what advice would you give to a young coach aspiring coach who wants to you know get to you know a, a work in the game like you have I think just be a be really inquisitive. I think one thing that I found when I first started this job is I didn't really have, and I don't see a lot of people now actually have their own philosophy, which is interesting I'm saying that because I'm saying we've got to develop the players along the Middlesbrough Football Club way, but I think to be the, to be a, a decent coach, and I've got loads and loads and loads to learn, but I think you have to understand what it is your beliefs and your values are in terms of football, and then how do they fit with the club that you're at. I think once you get that, I think you can then start to really develop and and be creative with your session design. I think that's massive for me. I don't see enough coaches who really plan and prepare sessions with the individual, the unit, and the team in mind. So we have these isolated individual practices where the players get the chance to develop technically, which is what we've talked about. But then how do we then put challenges in practices or, or certain elements in practices where the players get the opportunity to, to practice that ILP within a game-based um, experience? So how can we develop that into sessions? Um when I first started this, like my coaching journey, I did my advanced youth award and my B license, uh, my year license within two years. What I found was I'd go on a, I'd go on a course, I would learn something, I'd come back, I think that's good, I'll have a go at that. I'd go the next time, three weeks later, and I was just constantly just trying to coach like somebody else. So I go back to what I said, try and really nail down what it is that you believe in, what it is you want to develop, um, and then really start to think about how that will affect your journey. And I think ambition's key. I think people should be ambitious, not not silly with it. And sometimes you're going to get knocks. Like I've had knocks along my journey, but I've been extremely fortunate as well. Um, always try and be prepared, 100% for me. And talk about ambition. What's your ultimate ambition in the game? I think I'd obviously I'd love I'd love at some point that to be academy manager at Middlesbrough. I think that would be a fantastic way to uh, to kind of finish the academy journey for me. You know, you've had, you've had every other job, haven't you? Well, I haven't done the 18 to 20 degrees, but <laughs> right, I don't go. see almost, myself almost. Step, stepping back into coaching now. But you never, you never know. I think at this moment in time, I'm absolutely loving what I'm doing. And I really see this as a as a long-term long -term role, hopefully. Um, but I think the next bit, I'd love to, obviously, if Craig retires, when he retires, I'd love to be in a position to maybe take over from him or even maybe the person after him. Um, but I think that would be great, you know, having walked in at nine-year-old and then and then kind of going the full journey. I think that would just be be brilliant. But I also think, you know, it's interesting. Some people say, well, do you need to leave Middlesbrough to kind of really understand and, and see if, if you know what you think you know? And that'll be an interesting thing moving forward. But, you know, I, I think sometimes when you've got opportunities in front of you, like I've had, then you're right to take those opportunities and, and keep trying to develop yourself. Phil, thanks very much, mate. It's been fantastic. No, thanks, so. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.